Yeah, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, Thursday at five. And we're talking about Local 5 at 5, demands extension of unemployment benefits, additional COVID restrictions, makes it worse for them. And we got the exact right person to talk about that, Eric Gill of Local 5. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the show. Hi, Dave. How are you doing? Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm still suffering uh, in terms of trying to figure out where this COVID thing is taking us. And I, you know, I have this uh, impression that it's not not anywhere good, and that it's eating our economy while we speak. But you would be more familiar with that, you know, in the hospitality industry about how it is eating our workforce. Want to talk about it? Yeah, like it's the most important thing that people need to be talking about right now. If we're going to have a future in our economy, we do have to. No matter what future we may decide to do, we do have to secure the jobs we need now. And we need to avoid them being uh, deleted and diminished. And that's what's happening on a massive scale right now is the, the best jobs in our tourism workforce are being cut down considerably uh, using the pandemic as a pretext. Um, and this is resulting in uh, much enhanced profits for uh, corporate hotel owners and operators uh, and thousands and thousands of Hawaii people out of work and many of them that that will be permanent. Uh, it's uh, This is a situation where the pandemic did not cause this, but provided the pretext and the opportunity for employers to do what they wanted to do all along, which was reduce the, the workforce and increase their uh, profit margin. And this is playing out in front of our face right now. We had a almost 100% occupancy over the summer. Uh, our members in the union hotels that have rights to return and have a contract and 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 have the ability to enforce those rights, we never we never. We never cracked 70% of the of the 2019 uh, work hours, and uh, now we've gone down since the end of August, and it's worse now than it was then. So even you know, this is a, a real problem for for our community. With you know, I'm proud that we've built a, a high standard of wages and benefits for tourism workers in Hawaii. This is something that Local Five has done. We've spent 50 years doing this and and we've achieved a high standard across the country you know and one of the highest standards for uh hotel work uh, wages and benefits and those are the jobs that are being lost and and there's no good jobs to replace them you know and so sending somebody who is you know getting 40 hours a week making decent money in the hotel decent benefits able to support their families and putting them into the gig economy is just it's it's going to be terrible for our economy, and I don't know how the legislature guys can ignore this. They're fighting over the CARES money, all the money, uh, you know, all the government money that came in, and not taking any steps to protect our tax base next year. And how are we going to pay for the schools with everybody unemployed? It's uh, mm. I, this this is a situation where the interests of Hawaii's people and the interests of our corporate hotel owners diverged. What's good for them is not good for us. What's good for them is less people working. That's not good for us. Yeah. And if we're gonna have alternatives to tourism, we have to hold on to the, the best jobs in tourism and find alternatives, not get rid of the best jobs and suffer until somebody comes up with a, a new industry. That, that That is not a viable option for our community. So it sounds, for a moment, that um, you're the voice in the wilderness here. Who who joins you in making this point? Who joins you in in putting some pressure on the legislature? Well, I was interested. You know, I mean, in several weeks ago, I was on a, a PBS panel. You know, and they were talking about the future of tourism, and and there were a lot of community people there, and. To, you know, every single person said the same thing. What we need is fewer tourists of higher quality to generate, you know, more for our economy. Uh, it's, you know, and if you if you look at the actual situation, what's happened is we've got more and more tourists, and the jobs have have not been generated uh, with these additional tourists. So naturally, Hawaii's people are feeling the pinch, because what's happened is the increase in tourists of between six million and ten million. That didn't increase our jobs. 
It didn't increase the hotel workforce. What it did was push everybody into our neighborhoods in vacation rentals. And today, I guess, a star advertiser reported 20,000 vacation rentals. That's, that's two thirds of the number of work rooms in Waikiki. We're talking about a major shift uh, from good paying guests who use hotel services, get good, good services, spend their money in the resort areas versus 4 million new guests out in our communities, putting stress on our neighborhoods, putting stress on our traffic, our parks, uh, all of our public services. And, and we're not getting employment in return for that. Yeah, this is the very point that Jerry Agrusa made, Professor Jerry Agrusa from the, the Travel Industry Management School in Scheidler. Uh, just a week ago, um, you're saying the same thing he was saying. And putting pressure on those neighborhoods doesn't help us. If we're going to provide um, quality tourism, we have to provide quality tourism through, through you know, the workers, through the people who engage with the tourists. Uh, yeah. There's no engagement in, a, in, in one of those uh, bed and breakfast situations. Well, if you look at it, you know, I mean, uh, tourists in a neighborhood, you know, they got to go out to do anything right you know what are they gonna do sit in a house in a resort area we have restaurants for them if the restaurants are open we have activities tours for them we have all kind of things for them in the resort areas and most resort guests leave their car at the hotel most of the day they might go golfing or something those same guests if they were in a vacation rent or on that car going everywhere they're spending their time in the parks you know they're putting pressure they're looking on their yeah. instagram influencers and they're going up into our 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 sacred spaces our our private places you know the places that local people have always considered ours it's not ours anymore so people are turning against it and the, the more thoughtful elements in the industry are recognizing this as you say i'm glad to hear that tim is seeing it because you know uh, shedding services and, and becoming a low quality service destination is not a good future for Hawaii. And the thoughtful people in tourism agree with that. Last week, I had uh, Ernie Nishizaki speaking for to our convention delegates. He's what he ran Kyoya for years and, and was a general manager in no, numerous hotels and started as a busboy and at one of our hotels. And he, he said the same thing. We need a high quality service standard here. And especially if we're going to get our Japanese guests back, they want their room cleaned. They don't want to hear from Hilton that they're not going to, re, they're not going to clean rooms every day anymore. And uh, this is, a, this is a, a key point. What kind of tourists are we going to get if we don't even clean their rooms? If we don't provide a meal, we won't park their car for them. What kind of tourists are we going to get? And it's we're going to get vacation rental tourists as well. We're going to get the tourists we don't want, which is what many <laughs> Hawaii people experienced over the last six months. Yeah, you know, we had a lot of people in here over the summer, and Hawaii people are going. Mm, you know. Well, let's see. Let's see your chart. You have a chart, a couple of charts on this issue. Uh, I would like to uh, take a look at them because I think they demonstrate your point. Here's one. Uh, yeah. So this is this is. Uh, this is our, uh, I got a hard time even seeing this one, uh, uh, but this, this kind of- It says visitor arrivals as a percentage of 2019, right, right. 2019 same day arrivals. Yeah, so you saw over the course of the year, you know, the the occupancy built slowly. You know, we built fairly rapidly. We peaked uh, we peaked in the uh, the the spring and then had a dip, and then at uh, July fourth and you know the top of the summer, we were at virtually ninety plus percent across the board in Waikiki, and since that time, the arrivals have 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 trended down somewhat, uh, and and you can see some big big gaps. But the visitor arrivals, uh, you know, came close, you know, to where we were at in 2019 uh, and yet the number of workers recalled is a much lower curve i think that's on another on another of uh, the when we take a look at the other the, there it is there's another interesting graph yeah this is the visitor arrivals versus uh 2019 uh or, or rather excuse me this is uh from from 1990 and what you see here is is that uh, the um the blue graph is the jobs and the red graph, the red line is the arrivals. So what we've seen here in the last uh, five, six years, especially, uh, and uh, and if you you look at it from 
standpoint, you know, we had a we had a, a period of fairly flat line where the jobs and the visitor arrivals were fairly consistent, but that started to take off, and that's that four million dollar extra visitors there that you see. And what happened was the number of visitors went up, the jobs didn't. It went up a little bit. You know, so a 50% increase in arriving tourists resulted in only a 10% increase in in actual employment. So naturally, Hawaii people are questioning this. You know, how is this better for us? Having more and more guests, more and more tourists, and we're not getting any more jobs out of this. And, you know, unfortunately, the jobs in vacation rentals are pretty lousy jobs. These jobs have no benefits. They don't have a pension. They don't have medical. And many of them are off the book, 1099 type jobs. And you can't depend on them. You can't raise a family on that. That's that's side job work. And uh, but the main jobs are going away and all we're going to have is side job work. So, so what did, when you approach the uh, hospital, the hotels, the hotel association, what have you, and say, what happened, you guys? How come, you know, your industry isn't hiring as many people now? What do they say to you in response? Well, they they don't. Generally, they've refused to bargain with us uh, for the last year and a half, uh, and so we we they they have dodged the question. But we know what they say because we can read it in the paper. You know, the head of Hilton says to his investors, "We're going to reduce." permanently reduce the workforce to increase the value to our investors. And this is quoted in the Wall Street Journal. The, the, the biggest land, the biggest, the most, one of the most important owners is Park Hotels, now owns all the Hilton real estate. They have demanded that Hilton and the other operators that uh, operate hotels that they own reduce the labor force. In particular, they promised to reduce, uh, eliminate the practice of daily cleaning of rooms. So this is what they're promising their investors, and their investors are rewarding them. Hilton stock went up on these announcements. So what's happening is the corporate interest is they're going to make more profit, and they're going to promise their investors that. That's what they do. And what we do is we lose jobs. And in this case, you know, we lost 30% of the work hours, but, you know, with similar occupancy levels between 2019 and 2021, we had 30% at more than 30% less work hours for those same, those same weeks. So they're doing it right in front of our eyes. And they're doing is this, it. Is this a catch up thing, Eric? Are they, are they saying, for example, that in the, say the six or eight month period in 2020, you know, when things were really looking bad, uh, they would take, they were taking huge losses Oh, they and they had no way to cover those losses. Oh, so they cried for last year. Yeah, they certainly yeah. did. They, they they're, tra- they're trying to rate, make up for it, trying to, you know, um, bring in more revenue, more profit now to cover the losses they had there. Are they saying that? Well, they were saying that. But the fact of the matter is, these guys didn't get hurt last year at all. I mean, what they've done is they've loaded up on on cheap cash. You know, the uh, the banks and everybody are letting, you know, giving away free money. So what they've done is they've loaded up, they've doubled down on their debt burden. The problem for these owners is they've been playing for 20 years, you know, uh, a bubble game, you know, building a speculative real estate bubble in hotel real estate. And the hotels have been priced, not based on the price of the bricks and mortar of the land, but based on how big of a note that property could drive. So a lot of these hotels, especially the ones in the last few years that flipped ownership, you know, they, they, they bought in at a price with, that assumed that the, the place was going to be turning over revenue at a 90 plus percent occupancy level. So when you go down to zero occupancy, of course, they get a shock. Now, they, on the other hand, this is something they've been planning for years. They've been trying to do this for years. That's why we, in our strike in 2018, we struck and got language that's saying, you're going to clean that room each and every day. Well, yeah. they forgot how to read. And uh, What so happened? Are they, are they abrogating that provision? Absolutely. They're ignoring it. And, uh, and they're counting on the fact that arbitrators uh, enforcing labor agreements uh, do give substantial leeway for the, for the pandemic. And so, you know, we have a case coming up next month. And it's taken us a year to get this case before an arbitrator. They keep dragging it out. And the fact of the matter is, our language is clear. It says, you will clean that room each and every day. And they say, well, we have a principal disagreement on the interpretation of that language. And I'm going, oh, really? <laughs> Sounds like English to me. Yeah, you guys forgot how to read or what? <laughs> so it's all made up stuff. 
uh, Jay, that's what they're doing. They're, make, they're saying whatever they have to say, but what they're doing is selling their investors on a new model of tourism that's going to be a stripped down model. And they're consciously, they're discussing this in the trade press. They're consciously trying to emulate what the airlines did where once upon a time, we got a meal, we got a pillow, we got a blanket, you know, we mm. we could put on all kinds of things on a, on board and now they're charging us for all those things. Uh, that's where they want to go with the industry, which is fine for them. But for Hawaii, it's a disaster. We are an expensive destination. We can't afford, it's, it, it is expensive to come here. Well, it undermines our brand, doesn't it? It, it, it absolutely undermines Hawaii's brand. If we are seen as a bargain basement, no frills, kind of a spirit airlines type thing, why would anyone choose to come here? So, but wouldn't the uh, wouldn't the uh, HTA be concerned about this? Wouldn't the hotel association be concerned? Wouldn't professional, you know, hospitality organizations uh, be concerned? Wouldn't they want to say something? We don't want the brand undermined. Yeah, and I think they're starting to. I was struck, you know, I mean, I, I've known Keith Vieira, for example, for, you know, 40 years. He used to work with me at the hotel way back when. And, um, you know, he and I rarely agree. <laughs> but that, that, that night on PBS, he, he said the same thing. There's two basic things that we have to do to stop the bleeding. We have to maintain a high service standard with the jobs, you know, that means service, means people providing service, somebody to park your car, somebody to bring you a meal, somebody to clean your room, somebody to do all those things that people want from a hotel. We need high quality service and we've got to cut down on vacation rentals because what that's doing is it's just taking the overflow and, you know, just slamming that into our community and, and undermining our housing, undermining our quality of life and turning Hawaii's people against tourism. And that is a, is another bad thing that would happen. Sure. I mean, our aloha spirit is one of the reasons people come here. You can go out of Waikiki and you can drive to Haleiwa and you can go to the bar and you can come home back to the hotel with your kidney and your wallet. That's not true in Cancun. That's not true in Jamaica. That's not true in many other resort areas. You don't go into the neighborhoods because you're not going to come back. And so Hawaii is an open society because our people welcome tourists until now. And if they screw that up, yeah. we're not going well, to have well, what, 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 what are we talking about all hotels? Are we talking about, you know, the big ones, the international owners? Uh, yes. And we're also talking about the little ones, all of them, or just, just a subset of the hotels you see? Well, look, they're all competing, right? Yeah. You know, so what happens is this being driven by the biggies. I think Hilton is the most militant on this, but Marriott and Hyatt are the other big employers here. Mm -hmm. Highgate, uh, they've all done this. The big corporate, global corporations have done this, right? Uh, we're putting pressure on them. We're hoping to break that ranks, but right now they're all doing this. They're all saying it's on, you know, on request. And the fact is, because they don't bring in enough housekeepers in the first place for the day, you can request your room getting clean. It's still not going to get clean because they don't have anybody to do it. So, so we we have a long way to go to get to get back even where we were two years ago. And uh, but this is being driven by the big corporate hotels. What you see is uh, some hotels that have relative independence from that. You know, for example, Kahala. You know, here's a Japanese owner. Uh, it's a uh, you know they want it to maintain high standards all along they told us from day one no yes we're keeping daily room cleaning we're going to reopen our restaurants we're going to put our valets back if you've been to Colorado, you know they need valets and so um so some hotels have broken the ranks alawana hotels agreed with us to do that you know places like royal kona never stopped daily room cleaning you know this is a small place so it's the big corporate hotels that are seeking to change the paradigm of tourism to their benefit and our detriment well, you see, it strikes me that over the years, you've seen this in closer detail than I, but over the years, all our hotels have, have, have migrated offshore. What I mean is the owners, one by one, have become offshore owners, and they're very remote. As a matter of fact, they're, um, most of them are REITs, right? Uh, and they don't have the same kind of uh, sensibilities about, about Hawaii and the people and the brand that you've been discussing. Uh, it would be different, would it not, Eric? 
if we had local owners, wouldn't it be different? Well, it used to be we used to have local owners. Then, you know, Outrigger was the last and they were no longer, right? KSL bought Outrigger. The Kellys are gone. It's not a it's not a Hawaii company at all anymore. Um, and, you know, that's been true across the industry. So I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, a local owner would see a long-term benefit in maintaining the value of this this place as a resort destination. Uh, these guys, they're going to sell these hotels. You know, they buy and sell. That's what they do. And that's that's the reason they're in this boat. They've been buying and selling to each other, just jacking the price up for 20 years. And now now the guys who are, who, who are holding the note now are the ones stuck, right? When the music stopped in the musical chairs and they're standing up. So they're wanting, they're wanting to make their nut now. After they, they took all the profits now, right? You know, Marriott took all the money they got on the tax bill in 2017. They put it in their pocket. They put it in executive compensation. They didn't do anything to build the economy with it. Mm. They, these guys have taken every profit they can. But when it's time to pay up, they want us to pay. Yeah, well, you know, it strikes me that, uh, tell me if you agree, is that, um, that they could be very profitable um, anyway, in other words, uh, if they did everyday room cleaning, if they hired more people, uh, if they returned to the level of care and, uh, and comfort that used to be right here, um, they would still be profitable. But exactly. And they were in 2019 and 2018 and 2017. Hawaii was always at the one of the either it was us or New York City at the highest rev par. Rev par is revenue per available room. That's how they judge the profitability of a hotel. And we've always been in, in the top two for, for the last decade or more and always in the top three or five uh, forever. You know, Hawaii is a very lucrative place to operate a hotel. We don't have a down season like Chicago. There's nobody in Chicago between November and March. You know, we don't we don't have that. You know, we're a year round full destination. They make a pile of money here and they that's why there's been so much capital coming in here to build hotels. And, uh, you know, we're still seeing it, right? They're still permitting hotels along the Kapilani Corridor. <laughs> okay. You know, yesterday, uh, Eric, we had a show with uh, Roger Epstein. He's a uh, tax lawyer, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, he was talking about, you know, why the system, you, I know you'll agree with this, why the system around hotels uh, is broken in Hawaii, because um, we give them, the hotels, an environment that is world-class. We give them weather, uh, we give them a beautiful, you know, environment in all ways. We make it so easy, easier than most places, the 99% of the places in the world, we give them that, and they don't pay for it. Uh, and he was referring specifically to the, the, the tax on REITs. Uh, REITs are, you must be familiar with this issue, um, it's a pass-through. So the owners of the REIT are on the mainland. They do not pay taxes. Uh, and so the, the hotels are not treated like ordinary business corporations in Hawaii. And they don't pay taxes uh, like ordinary business corporations in Hawaii. Now, yeah. you know, you, you, would, you, you would probably tend to forget that if it wasn't the fact that they are capitalizing, capitalizing on the environment. They're capitalizing on the special aloha, the special you know, weather and, and greenery and so forth in Hawaii. They're not paying the freight. They're letting everyone else pay the freight. Right. And, and you know, we are a community that's been extraordinarily welcoming, right? Our beaches are public beaches. In California, you pay to go to the beach, right? You know, these are all, these are all things that we in Hawaii have to offer and have attracted people from all over the world. And that's what is getting deteriorated. Uh, so, but the REITs are, you know, these are, REITs under tax law have a tax break and they're not supposed to get involved with employment issues. They're not supposed to bargain contracts. They're not supposed to be parties at the table. Today they are. They are being activists. They're being, they're demanding the, the uh, management companies make these cuts. The management companies, you know, have, have some independence in their interests. But basically, if they don't do what they're told, then the, the owners can get rid of the management company, find sure. somebody else. And so they could easily put in a franchise operation, for example. And a franchise cuts a Marriott or a Hyatt or a Hilton you know, operating company out of the mix. You know, so, 
so the owners are driving this thing and some of the big owners like Park are REITs and it is absolutely against the law for them to do that. They're not so, um, involved themselves in, in labor negotiations, much less saying we demand that you get a, you know, a 20 percent cut in payroll. Is this all in that arbitration you were talking about? If you win that arbitration, is this going to fix the problem? No. If we look, we have I have to arbitrate this case against each company. Mm. So we got we got we got the dozens of arbitrations lined up, more than we can handle. And and you know, the fact is I shouldn't be having to arbitrate plain language. You know, it's not just the daily room cleaning. They got managers doing our work all along. That's section one point two. You cannot do the union work. They, they, they are pushing the envelope purposely to see how far they can cut before we are able to mount an effective defense. Well, it sounds and, like they're taking the COVID, you know, phenomenon, the COVID crisis, uh, and making an opportunity out of it. That's opportunism, that opportunistic. And, and when the smoke clears, they've managed to cut the payroll, um, not and, because of COVID, but as a cover. That's what I hear you saying. Yeah, and it's not the first time. We, you know, we had a 10% total reduction in work hours after 9-11. Never got those back. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, getting around, getting around to 2020, now they're taking another, you know, 20, 30% off the top. But don't you have the countervailing power? I mean, I know, you know, in COVID, you were, you were having trouble paying benefits because, you know, it was such an extraordinary loss for the union but to have all the people out of work at the same time. Um, but but query, uh, as we return, it's hard to say this, but as we return to more of a normal situation, don't you have countervailing marketplace uh, powers uh, where you can say to them, you guys, you got to play it right. If you don't play it fair, you won't you won't have anybody at all working in the hotels. Can't you say that? Well, we can strike, but I can't strike them till next summer because we have a contract in force. It has, you know, we can't strike till the end of the contract, you know, and they're taking advantage of that fact. Uh, we do have some hotels that that could strike. Those aren't generally the bad players. The smaller hotels that uh, that are that we didn't get finished last year because everything fell apart. So, so we can strike some people, but not we can't strike the the big players at this point. Uh, we could boycott them, which is a lot of work. And especially when you're talking about individual travelers, uh, it's difficult to get the message to them. We are communicating to guests every day. We have teams out on the beaches with flyers. We're, we're getting the guests. The guests, 99% agree with us. We want to get our room cleaned. Uh, and they are requesting room cleaning. So, you know, we've been fairly successful in some hotels uh, getting the, the daily room cleaning rates up. Not because the company, but because we organize the guest to to de demand that. Uh, our 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 quiver of arrows is not that expensive, you know, extensive. I can file grievances on them, and we filed dozens and dozens of grievances. It takes you know six months to get a hearing, and one doesn't know what the arbitrator is going to do uh, on these things. And so what they're doing is they're just they're just dragging it out if they get a good arbitration decision then i'm screwed for another six months at least mm -hmm. you know we already had an arbitrator say it was okay you know to not feed our people we have a contract saying you got to provide food and they weren't feeding people and the arbitrator said well you know we contract says that but because of the the mandate in force this was back in april or whenever we filed it um you know letting the company off the hook so that our decision we need we need the government to step up here. Other governments have done this. San Francisco. Well, let's talk about that. You're talking about the state government, right? The state of Hawaii. State and city. We've asked state, city. We've asked every level, and nobody's doing anything. What have you asked them for specifically in terms of relief? Well, last year we pushed hard for recall legislation. We wanted we wanted the, the government to say you have to bring the people back to work that you laid off. And many hotels haven't done that. They didn't bring back the people. They've subbed it out. They brought back fewer people. They brought back different people. They brought back people for less. This is happening right in front of us. All the non-union places, they're, 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 they're able to do that, and they're doing it. And so, so that piece of the industry is already you know, dribbling, dribbling out behind us. But we wanted recall rights. We wanted a bunch of safety stuff as well. And we wanted, we wanted them to 
to mandate daily house cleaning because that is the biggest job creator that the one toggle and and that's something that you can put your finger on and enforce it's not like a restaurant you know you might have 100 100 people for dinner tonight and 50 tomorrow in housekeeping you know who's checked in you know how many rooms you're going to clean you can you can figure out how many people it is we wanted them to do that nobody would do anything we talked to the legislature you know three sessions right since the start of the pandemic and nothing came out nothing came out from them we talked to the governor the only thing the governor did of the things that we've uh that we've requested is he he did take our suggestion to make them post their safety protocols publicly so they could be enforced and but that hasn't been enforced many of them didn't even do that uh and so Unlike San Francisco, where the Board of Supervisors early on put a put a mandate in for for the um, for the pandemic, but they've since made it a permanent mandate requiring daily room cleaning in San Francisco hotels, and they've done that. The you know the Nevada legislature passed a, a, a much more sweeping law. We've other other jurisdictions have 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 done recall rights, and those jurisdictions are you know hotels are an important employer in every place, but not like here. This is what we got. This is the and, engine of the economy. And, yeah. and the, uh, the government has really not seen fit to encourage other sectors. So no. uh, and that's kind of in a left-handed way, good news for the hotel industry, because there's no competing sector. We are relying on, as we have for the past 50 years, uh, tourism. That's what we got. Yeah. And uh, think we really have to make it the best tourism in the world. Yeah. And so the, so the legislature, you know, if you look at what they've done, you know, they've taxed workers on employment to give that tax money to the employer so they didn't have to replenish the unemployment fund. They, you know, this, this is what the government has done, fight over the CARES money and, and not even put it where it needs to be. But they didn't do anything to, to get ahead of this problem, even though, Jay, I had the same conversation a year ago. Well, that's the thing. Uh, and you've been asking for the, the extension of unemployment benefits, uh, right? What kind of response you get on that one? Well, so, has anybody said they're going to do that? I mean, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, they, they could call a special session and do something there, but they're not. Uh, are they going to do something in the legislative session coming up? I wonder. Uh, there's no you know, and, and the way that this legislature works, it doesn't really matter what you testify on a bill, they got to replace it with another bill and pass that. Yeah. And so <laughs> so you can't even you can't even impact them because they're making decisions out of the public eye behind the scenes and, and just just pushing it out. And so we we have a extraordinarily bad legislative leadership in my view. And you know I'm I've, I've had great sympathy for the governor having to deal with all this stuff. He's been cautious. You know, there's many things he, di he didn't do. But, you know, overall, we came through this pandemic much better than many other communities. But he has not been proactive about defending the future of our of our industry here or making sure that we have the tax base and the employment base to pro you know, provide the basic Econ economics so that we can develop other opportunities for well, well paint me a picture of the future eric really it's like out of dickens uh and the, and the christmas carol it's it's what you know what happens if things continue the same way i mean i'm i'm thinking that the one weapon if you will if, if you will that you have in your arsenal is a strike at the end of these big hotel contracts but that's not so easy to do you have to have reserves for that uh, you have to have you know public support for that. Not not clear that would solve the problem. So let's let's look at the Christmas future part of this. Suppose nothing happens. Suppose the city doesn't do anything. Suppose the legislature, state legislature, doesn't do anything, and it's all pretty much the same. And we'll be in you know COVID for a while. And the hotel guys and the REITs, you know, they'll continue this strategy because they like a big bottom line. They like to spin the hotels. It works well for them. What happens to the industry? What happens to you and your members? What happens to Hawaii? Paint me a picture of the future, Eric. Yeah, I mean, the basic problem that Hawaii hotel workers have is we don't have enough of them in the union. So I, I can definitely defend the the. the the workers we represent, but in the places that are represented by nobody or by the longshoremen, I, I have no way to 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 
to to affect that. And so so the problem is, you know, we're we got one third of the, the one one third of the grip on the problem, and so we are we're not able just to drive things directly. What we need is we need the, the government to take this seriously. The immediate issue is people don't have medical and they don't have unemployment now, and they're laid off again, and they can't get unemployment now because you have to you know you can get it, but it's based on your income for the last year and nobody was working. So you, what are you going to do? Get seventy five bucks a week, and and feed your family on that. And what that's going to do is it's going to put a, a huge amount of new privation and and suffering into our communities, um, and right at the wrong time when you know we're also being faced you know with the crowded conditions there and the pandemic, hitting uh, working people disproportionately, you know hitting uh, Hawaiians and you know Micronesians and Filipinos and people of color, you know disproportionately, not least because everybody's living in very crowded situations, right, where it transmits easily. And so so what's going to happen here is that the social divisions in Hawaii will, will, will get more intense. You know, the richer are going to be richer, and, you know, they're asking people to come in, right? The state's over there saying, come down, you can work from home, why not work from here? We're going to have wealthy people coming in. We are already. And the working people got nowhere to go. And but why don't they just leave? Are they leaving? Why don't they just leave? Well, where are they going to go? I mean, at the end of the day, I, I just, you know, we just had my international union meeting in Vegas. They got the same problem there. They got, they got thousands of people on the bench and that, that place is busy. And, uh, you know, so, you know, people are going to have to go outside and find jobs somewhere else. And, you know, and that's, you know, moving your whole family and all that. And, mm. and you lose that? them. You lose them. The workforce uh, that is that expresses aloha to tourism that that gives us the brand, uh, they're at risk of disappearing. Huh? Well, yeah, and it's and it's not just that. Obviously, you know, even people that are annoyed by too many tourists, everybody's got an auntie that that loves their hotel job, right? And you know, when if that auntie's laid off, now what you got? Now you got annoying tourists and no job. And that's the, the prospect coming up where, you know, where, you know, Hawaii's people will get less and less of a, a bang for the buck in terms of our investment in tourism. The exploitation will increase. People's poverty will increase. People's desperation will increase. As you say, people will be forced to out migrate, you know, give up the idea of owning a home or raising a family here. All those things are terrible social uh, effects for our community. And, um, you know, I mean, that's easy for them to say, just move. Well, the Hilton in San Francisco ain't employing you either. Mm. So, you know, where, where are you going to go? And, uh, it, you know, and that, and even if everybody moves, what does that do? So, what, are we going to replace our local people with rich people self-employed? Is that the future we want? Yeah. Well, I, you haven't made me feel much better about this, I have to say. Um, and I wonder if you take a moment, Eric Gill, will you please, and, and leave a message with our viewing public. What would you like them to take away from this conversation? Look, I mean, we have a, we're at a crucial turning point. I'm, I've been talking about the dangers here, and, and the optimism is, is there too, because the fact of the matter is the hotels are doing this because the situation got pandemic shook up, right? You know, it's like a, you know, it's like 52 remix, right? <laughs> the cars all got spread all over the table. That provides opportunities too. And you can see some of those that developed during the pandemic, right? Uh, I was really encouraged to see, for example, how um, farmers and farm to table and how, how, how local people really did. I mean, my members, as soon as they got laid off, they started planting stuff. You know, three months later, they're selling tomatoes on the Internet. You know, we have we have always needed a strong agricultural cent, uh, center in our islands. You know, we, we don't we don't have enough food to feed ourselves, not to mention that millions of tourists we're inviting. So I think I think this situation also provides the crucial opportunity to reboot. Let's really rethink this. Let's think it over. What kind of tourism do we need? And and how much tourism should we have, and what what controls should we place on that? But in order to do that, we also have to provide other employment. Uh, I got thousands of members who are skilled farmers. Right, they come yeah. from countries, and that's what they do. Sure. And and you know we need people to grow food. Uh, 
And I'm, I'm conscious that, you know, a country like Holland, for example, has been able to organize their farmers. Their farmers make good money. And uh, it, it's a job people want. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can do that if we organize our uh, agricultural production and, and make it so that the brokers don't slaughter the, the farmers on, on the prices. You know, the farmers need to keep their prices. And people need food at a cheap price, and we can do that. We can create employment. Um, we can put people people onto the land and do that stuff. We've got all this land is out there. Look at all the plantation land still undeveloped. And so there's a there's there's some possibilities in, in the past that we could do. You know, King Kamehameha the fourth and the fifth, their policy was homestead land to people coming off the plantations. Not Hawaiians, everybody. So they developed the whole agricultural economy from scratch after all the Hawaiians, you know, the Hawaiian farmers were killed, right, in the diseases. The kings repopulated the land. They put people back there. It created a, a new economy here. And they were very forward thinking. And yet now, what do you have to do? Do you know what it takes to get a farm going? Huh. You know, it's just really difficult. And, um, you know, and then how do you sell your goods and all that? You know, the state needs to take, you know, some real action. And, you know, I, you know, I've been through my life, I've heard the Kohala project, you know, we've seen the fish ponds up in Kahuku, all these ideas of different industries. And, you know, we can all say great, you know, but none of them worked out to create substantial employment. But historically, Hawaii always had agriculture. And, and in my dad's day, they brought tourism in to diversify, right? So that people had more opportunities beyond the two crop plantation economy. And that worked, right? We have a lot more opportunities now. But now what happens? Now we got no agriculture economy. Now our plantations have left. And, um, you know, we, we're not self-reliant. So some of these things are, are basic and simple. You know, we don't have to think of all kind of new industries. We can we can do what we're good at, but somebody got to lead that, and and the state and the governments have to provide the conditions that that people can do those things. Now, I don't think that means we don't look for other industries. But you know, I've been I remember living on the Big Island when, you know, Mufi and the Sea Brewer guys were pushing for the spaceport. You know, let's put a spaceport down there. And you know, I remember Ariochi wanted the tech parks. You know, let's get tech industry going. Everybody wants tech industry. Well, we don't have Caltech. We don't have MIT. We don't have that. You know, we. we they're not going to do that. The tech companies aren't going to do that here. And, uh, you know, it might be a good place to shoot off rockets, but. Well, we got to focus on what we do best. And that, and that is hospitality. And we have to protect our workforce and hospitality. And we have to be more uh, sympathetic to the, the people who have lost their jobs or who might lose their jobs now. Yeah, and we got to uh, cut down on the vacation rentals. Uh, that is yeah, really, that too. Yeah. that's what's turning people against tourism, you know, and yeah. I think the hotels are getting caught up unfairly in that, yeah. you know, and even the legislature just slapping on the tourist tax. Let's let the counties do some more, you know, let's jack it up. You know, they, they just see it as a cash cow, but they're not looking close enough to actually feed the cash cow what it, <laughs> needs, to, what it needs to eat. We're out of time, Eric. Eric Gill, Local 5, <clears throat> thank you for updating us on, on the whole condition of the <clears throat> hotel workforce. We really appreciate knowing about it because it affects every single one of us. Thank you, Eric. Well, thanks, Jay. It's important that people hear this, and I appreciate the ability to communicate through you. So thank you for that. Aloha.